Welcome to Drinking Bros, presented by GhostBed.com. Welcome to Drinking Bros, kids. Coincidence or not a coincidence, Anthony? By coincidence, you mean is it a coincidence that we have probably the most prominent two-way activist in the country on the show today when Texas passed constitutional carry? I would say it's probably a coincidence. We couldn't have <laughs> planned it that way because <laughs> if I had that much influence over things, we wouldn't be as fucked up as we were, right? True, true. Uh, Colin Noir, how are you, man? Welcome to Drinking Bros. Hey, I'm doing pretty good. Glad to have me. I actually just got back from the gym, so if I look a little shiny and Sexual chocolatey, that's why. Nah, you look swole, dude. Was it arms day for you? <laughs> it was actually legs day. <laughs> was it really? Damn, dude. I, I, I blasted out some arms this morning, so I might. I, I just got out of the gym as well. If I stand up, I look like Josh Brolin from the Goonies. I had sweatpants <laughs> on the whole shit, so. Uh, well, problem is when I, when I work out, and that, my pump goes straight to my arms and nowhere else. So. <laughs> <laughs> look, is there any other place you wanted to go, though? I'm beach no, muscles, that's, that's beach that's muscles only. Point. Glamour muscle. Is that what it called? Glamour yeah. muscle? Yeah. That's yeah. all I really care about. Yeah. Um, I, I really, I honestly, back in the day, like back when I was like in college, I did this workout program literally called Title Built for Show. And the whole program was designed just to build the muscles that people see and make you look aesthetically better. Mm. Yeah. That I, was it. I, that's all, you, boom, right here. You're talking yeah. to the big guy right here. That's, that's all daddy wants in this world. <laughs> that's it. That's all I want. Uh, Dan, explain what happened today in, in Texas with this law. You know it better than I do. Um, well, I, I a mean, lot of people were shocked that it passed. Yeah, we've been hearing about it for weeks now. Actually, I guess months. Um, Texas passed what, what is colloquially, uh, colloquially called constitutional carry, which means the fact that you have the right to own a gun means you have the right to carry the goddamn thing, which you know would seem... Logical. I mean, what the fuck? If you've been through this whole background check process that we have in, in place now to buy that firearm, there's no additional background check that happens that's different than the one you got before that allows you to carry the permit. It's just a fucking layer of bureaucracy and government control so they can generate revenue. That's all it is. And so they can control gun rights. That's all it is. We were talking before the show started, Colin animated that this is a good thing, obviously, but it's like this should have, should have happened a long time ago, right? Yeah. Uh, are you shocked by this, Colin? Um, yeah, largely only because you got to keep in mind, I live in Dallas and I live in a blue, I live in a blue. Uh, oh, we're in Austin. In, so we know what that's I live about. in a blue county. I live in a blue county. Yeah. So, uh, and then you take that, multiply that by the number of people who've come from California and New York and all the stuff like that. I'm surprised it passed now. Um, other than that, I like, like you, like I said, I thought it should have passed a long time ago. This should have been the state of things for decades, um, but it's not. So I'm, I'm more kind of yeah, I'm, I'm measuredly happy. Mm. Yeah, I, it's one of those things for me because we're, we're in Austin, Texas. So we're right down the road okay. from you. It, that's all blue as well. It's, it's strange because you hear Texas on the news, right? And you're like, all right, guns, parties. No, the three biggest cities in the state of Texas are blue. Um, Dallas, Austin, and then, and then San Antonio. I don't know what Houston is. You've lived here longer than we have, but, uh, uh Houston is pretty blue too. Yeah. Houston's pretty blue too. Um, uh, and with this, um, we'd gotten a weird phone call maybe three or four months ago, and it was to have uh, Beto O'Rourke's campaign manager on the show. Um, I can talk about it because they canceled. Um, and Probably after watching any of our other shows. Probably. Where I said that, well, I said a lot of stuff. Let's be, <laughs> let's be real. Probably. But the, sounds, like what happened, sounds like what happened to me when I was supposed to be on a, a Google Hangout with mm. uh, President Obama. And then Google was fine with me. I submitted my questions. Mm -hmm. And they were like, yeah, good. We love these questions. And then all of a sudden, like the day before, the White House was like, yeah, we need you to find somebody else on this panel to replace him. So. Really? I have the emails to prove it to. Well, I guess wow. you're, are you not, are you not black enough? What, what's the, what was it? <laughs> Did Joe Biden get to you and, and rob you of your blackness somehow? Because he I, does that some, you, sometimes. You know, oddly enough, the funny thing is the person I replaced me with was black. Um, and she ended up asking a gun question. The difference was she didn't really follow it up. She didn't, mm. she didn't kind of go past that surface level. Right. So, and I think that's what they were expecting me to do. Yeah, um, that for sure. Just, of, stick and move. of course. But you've, you know. You've kind of got a history of, of jumping into the lion's den, for lack of a better phrase. Um, <laughs> My masticus, man. Well, for sure. But yeah, you also handle yourself very professionally. You, you went on Bill Maher, and that's not exactly the most comfortable place 
for somebody that's I mean, he's kind of he's a little bit anti woke and speaking out about it more now, but not the gun thing. Right. And he's a pretty harsh liberal, somebody that talks a lot of shit. And he usually brings on panelists specifically to antagonize whomever the guest is. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you've been you go into places like that and you do pretty well with that. So I feel like, you know, it's it is what it is. Right. You're, you're good. You're good at that. I think that scares people that you're not a pushover, that your arguments aren't at the surface level. I think it frightens yeah. a lot of people on the left. Well, yeah, because, I mean, you have to think you have to think beyond your emotions at that point. Right. And a lot of people like to engage. A lot of people like to invest their egos into their positions on issues, which is mm. fine. If you're researching you know what you're talking about. Um, when you don't know what you're talking about, you're going to do everything to guard that ego because you basically surrounded it by a facade of cards. Um, and so anybody who goes below the surface will see that immediately. So instead of actually being able to have a conversation intellectually, you, you kind of you do things like. Um, you belittle, you make fun of, mm. you, um, you engage in pejoratives and so forth and so on. So for, for a lot of people on the other side, I, I call them now at this point, I, I call them the gun control lobby. Mm. Like that, my videos, that's what I call them now. Um, Cause that's essentially what they are. It's an aggregation of people who I honestly believe hate guns or are vehemently out for more control by any means necessary. Yeah. And I, I think that's what scares people is uh, not only are you educated in guns, but you're very educated in real life. You're a lawyer. So when you speak, there is power behind your words where it's not, you know, somebody they picked off the street and they're going to throw online and be like, all right, great. Talk about guns and, and say why the left is bad. You know all the laws. Um, you, you know everything about guns and, and what your right as a citizen is in this country. And, and again, I think that's the scariest part is they want the dumb people out there. They don't want the smart people out there like you are. No, they, I mean, like, call them, they call them useful idiots. That's what, that's essentially what they call them. Um, and unfortunately, they make up the majority. And so for a lot of, in a lot of ways, what I tend to do, what I try to do is, you know, I was actually at the gun range filming a video. I was filming a gun review on the Ruger Max 9 nah, last week. And while I was filming, I had a guy come up to me and he stopped, he pulled his truck over because he saw me filming. And he's like, hey, just want to introduce myself, say thank you for everything you're doing. But also, you know, just let you know, you kind of go, you kind of go light on them a little bit. In your videos, and I um, and I told them that's kind of on purpose. Um, and the reason why is because what I've started to try to do, especially with my videos now, considering the number of first-time gun owners and people who are new to the conversation that are following me now, is I'm trying to talk to the people in the middle. I really am, um, and by and large, because they're the most important people. They're uh, unfortunately because you have you have our minorities on the extreme ends of each of this of the, each of the on this issue. And then you have this wide swath of people in the middle who are kind of looking for a direction on what to believe and think on this particular issue. So they're bouncing their heads back and forth like they're watching a tennis match and trying to figure what to believe. And so what I try to do is to create content that speaks to them directly and helps them understand it um, to the degree that they can come up with an opinion on it, an opinion on it that makes them more, more informed, but I know inevitably will lead them to understand the importance of this right. Right. Because yeah. a lot of people don't understand a lot of these issues. I mean, we, we had uh, just last week, we had, not that this is necessarily a gun related thing, but we had uh, Chris Hansen, right, from uh, To Catch a Predator. And, and that's what he's most known for, but he's done a lot of stuff. And he kept uh, interjecting these <clears throat> subtle comments about, uh, uh, about institutional racism and expecting everybody just to go along with that idea without challenging it. And mm -hmm. finally, I was like, look, dude. There are 374 million interactions between police and citizens every year, and uh, less than one thousandth of one percent end in any kind of bad way, much less in a violent bad way. Mm. So this this narrative that you push is absolute nonsense. And he his you know rebuttal to that was well, those th those things are aberrant. So they are worthy, or they're newsworthy. That's what we report on: are things that are out of the ordinary. <clears throat> and I'm like, yeah, that's fine, but. What you're also doing is constantly reporting on those things that are, out, as you say, out of the ordinary, and then pretending as if your coverage of it somehow demonstrates how much it's happening. Mm -hmm. Like, that's all anybody's ever talking about. Yeah, because you won't shut the fuck up. Yeah. That has nothing to do about reality, right? The irony about that, what, about what he, his response was to you, as far as, you know, what we're talking about what's out of the ordinary, was well, like, yeah, you're making my point. Yeah. But it doesn't happen that often. Yeah, it's exactly. the same thing with the, with mass shootings. I mean, I'll mm -hmm. make the same argument. You know, the reason why they are so, so sensationalized is because they don't happen as often as people think they do. But like you pointed out, because the media harps on it and sits on it, 
over and over and over again, um, people start to con- people start to assume sensationalism with frequency. Right. And, and they're not the same. Certainly not. No, but when you keep pushing it in, in front of everybody's faces day after day after day, then they think it's the norm and they think it's, it's, it's just a part of everyday life and then they become more fearful and more scared. Uh, and then that pushes the real issue out of the way. And now you're just driven by fear on a day-to-day basis, which is smart about what you're doing when you said you were going after people in the middle. Look, people on the far right and the far left have already made up their minds. Right. Uh, it's like you said, uh, it's, it's the people in the middle where you're like, hey, I can provide the best education about guns that I could possibly give you. Make up your own mind after that. It's not like you're jamming a gun in somebody's face saying, here, you should take this, man. You, you need to own a gun. Right. No, absolutely. It's, uh, you know, and I have, I have a plethora of conversations in real life with people about this issue. And it is hard sometimes not to get emotional because sometimes you have to pull yourself back um, and, and understand that a lot of these people just don't have a lot of the information that I have when I'm talking to them. So I have to remember that because sometimes, you know, when you start to, you know, when you really start to dive into a subject matter and you start to ascertain all this information and all this knowledge, and then when you start talking to other people, you're just like, God, you're a fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> but, but in reality, it's just, you've amassed so much information that things that are, are um, that are kind of nuanced to certain people, they're, they just, they're just a given to you because you've been studying and paying attention to this issue for so long. And so I have to keep reminding myself of that when I talk to, to certain people with respect to this issue and also understand um, what I've learned to do over the time is try to figure out where the motivations are coming from. Mm. Once you can kind of understand somebody's motivation for why they feel a certain way, you can talk to them on that level and, and you can break down those barriers a lot quicker. Um, yeah, but that only so. happens when you can actually have a, con- a back and forth conversation with somebody without the risk of losing everything if you say the wrong thing in that conversation. We, we've created this. Uh, I've got another show called American Party with Dakota Meyer. We were just talking about it this morning about how there's no tolerance for somebody being wrong at some point and then getting the right information and then moving into the category of right, which is, by the way, how everybody on earth forever has learned anything. Yes, that's that's fucking how it works. I'm I'm ignorant. I don't know what's happening. Then I learned math. Now I know math. Yeah. But somehow we can't apply that to being wrong on an issue. We, it's the equivalent is if uh, with the with the fucking cancel culture, particularly on Twitter, is if you change the rules to football and then went back retroactively and applied those rules to the games that happened 15 fucking years ago. That's stupid. Yeah. Only a psycho would even think of doing something like that. Right. And it lets you know that it's not about justice. It's about they're they're being punitive. Mm-hmm. They're upset about whatever it is. And they're trying to lash out at people. That's not how you govern a country. It can't be because this is the result. Yeah, not only is this the result, but again, it's admitting when you're wrong and right about certain issues. I mean, shit, I got in a fight with my wife the other day. Uh, It was my fault. I came back, you know, an hour later and I said, hey, what I said was stupid. And I was wrong and we moved on with our lives. But that's the only way we could move on with our lives if I said, hey, I'm, I'm wrong about this and I made a mistake and I apologize. Why aren't others more receptive to that, Colin? I think a lot of it is we've, we've turned, I want to say we, I, I, I want to place it on the media because it's so much, so much easier to do that. But I do think they have a big hand in this is we've turned, we've turned dialogue and debate into a combative engagement. Like a, it's almost like a sport now. So the goal isn't, which changes the goal, right? The mm-hmm. goal then becomes winning, winning versus yeah. to trying to discover or figure out solutions um, or enlightenment. And so when the overall goal becomes winning, there's no way in hell you're gonna get me to sit up here and say, well, you know what? I actually don't know anything about that or I'm wrong. Because then essentially what that means is I've admitted defeat. And and for me, I've gotten caught up in that my damn self, to be honest. Like if you look at the very genesis of what I used to do, if you look at some of the platforms that I've gone on or even on my show in Noir, when I was having conversations with people and talking to them about it, I, I saw myself slipping into the more combative in terms of, trying to win the conversation versus mm. having the conversation. Um, but I will say there's a certain insecurity when you're a public figure like myself um, and you know people look up to you to be their voice. There is, this, there is that insecurity where you're like, can I admit that I don't really know this much about this particular aspect of the issue without letting the people who look up to me down? Right. And I'm to be honest with you, I don't know where to, I don't know that that's, that's a balancing act that I honestly have not perfected. I don't really know where it lives or where it doesn't. So I kind of walk around on a daily basis with that insecurity. And so I find myself trying to constantly just 
amass and get as much information as I possibly can um, in order to never find myself in that position. But I don't really know how realistic that is. Yeah, but you, you at least open yourself up for it. Uh, and you're open to talk about it. Um, yeah. And you do things that are unexpected. Like, you know, I know you got into it with the NRA uh, back in the day. Uh, did you end up dropping out of them? Uh, mm -hmm. Like dropping out of that? Uh, how did that work out? There was something you were unhappy about where they were promoting something that you didn't agree with. So I never got into it per se, but there was, there was an aspect, like for instance, really what it was, the bump, bump stock issue. So for me, I didn't necessarily agree with the way that they handled it. Um, and so what I did, what I set out to do is I understood my platform at the time and I understood how big my voice was. So before jumping on my platform and stating my distaste with it, um, I tried to get as much information about why the decisions were being made the way that they were being made. Fortunately, there are a lot of people who think that I was kind of just hiding because you know I'm with the NRA and I am not allowed to talk about this or talk about that. When in reality, it was I was trying to understand what what the drive was, what was the motivation behind doing what it was that we did. And it was explained to me and I understood it to a degree. Didn't necessarily agree with it, um, but I more or less understood it. So what I set out to do is I stated my opinion on it and left it at that. Um, unfortunately, the way social media works, a lot of people didn't see that opinion. And I was so busy, I really didn't have time to put the video out. So what I did was I put a written message out about how I felt on it. And then in subsequent interviews that I did um, with people where I was asked about it, because it was a hot topic at the time, mm -hmm. Um, I expressed, I was like, no, I don't agree with the banning of bump socks at all. Like, I don't, I don't agree with um, compromising on them in the slightest, personally. But the way the internet works, a lot of people didn't either hear that or they just kind of ignored it and wanted to make me out to be the bad guy. Um, but by and large, I was a victim. I, I was more or less a victim of uh, collateral damage because a lot of the work I was doing was by way of their ad agency, which was Ackerman McQueen. So for me, when everything fell out between Ackerman McQueen and the NRA, my platform was on NRA TV. And so when that relationship evolved, so did that platform. And so at that point, there was nothing left for me to do, nor was I getting any contact or any communication from the NRA. Got it. And, and what was the pushback from the fans on that? I'm curious, um, because I know once it happens, like you were talking about with the Internet, once it happens, it is swift and it is out of nowhere, and I'm sure your phone melts it to the ground. Mm. Oh, yeah. oh, absolutely. So the, the backlash was substantial. It was, it was pretty substantial, largely because, like I said, people, and I understood it. Initially, I kind of got mad and I took it personal, but I understood it. I, I understood it because there are a lot of people who looked up to me to be their voice, not because they couldn't form their own coherent thoughts or own coherent sentences, but I had the platform. So I understood when they felt that I was being radio silent strategically that they felt that I had let them down or felt that I agreed with the banning of a bump stock or so forth and so on, which wasn't the case. Um, so on my end, it was pretty, pretty substantial, actually. Yeah, um, we, we had some friends go through it, which is why I ask, uh, with yeah. Black Rifle Coffee, and you're kind of stuck with what message to put out. Is it too soon? Is it written? Is it a video? What should we say? What do the fans want? What, what, what do I believe in? And uh, oftentimes, you know, shit, most publicists in Hollywood will tell you, just wait three days and then put out a statement. Uh, how quick were you to do that? I would say me, I think I did it within three days, but I think only because I went to a bar and started drinking. <laughs> and so I started and so I started drunk tweeting. <laughs> um, but other than that, I probably would have waited maybe a little bit longer. Largely, it was me just getting information because I, I'm not going to I'm not going to bullshit. Like there was a component of me understanding and balancing, engaging in the balancing act of an organization that I'm in, being in a relationship with. Mm. There, there's no denying that. So for me, it was like it's kind of like you have a best friend and you're like, I don't necessarily agree with your position on this. So like, bro, talk to me, like what, what's going on? Let me, let me hear you before I go out there and just say, yo, Todd is a freaking idiot, right? right. He doesn't always talk about it, disagree with them. I'm like, yo, give me some, give me some understanding about your motivation and thought process here with respect to why you feel that way. Right. Um, and so that's what I was trying to do in the time periods that I wasn't doing much talking um, because I knew anything that I said would be leveraged to be either against them or for them. And so understanding that I was like, all right, let's, let's, Let's be non-emotional about this. 
because initially when I heard their statement on it, I was like, what the hell? And I was gonna, and I stopped, I just stopped myself from tweeting something out. And mm -hmm. I said, just wait, go get some more information, figure out what's going on from that perspective and then proceed from there. Was it scary leaving them? Because that, that like you said, that was your platform. And then, you know, you, you kind of went out on your own. You've since exploded. But I have to imagine there was a few days in there where you were like, ah, oh, shit, what am I going to do? Yeah, but that's just natural because I'm not I'm naturally paranoid like that. <laughs> like I'm always I'm always expecting the world to implode every like every other day. Um, but yes, there, there was definitely some of that because, you know, it was like, whoa, like where where is this going? Um, and I couldn't I couldn't see where the road ended um, and being the kind of transient control freak that I am, not knowing that kind of bothered me a little bit. Yeah, I fuck. We're we're in the same boat here. I mean, I, how do you get away with it on YouTube? Are you monetized at all? Uh, yeah, now I am. It, it's it's a, it's an ongoing battle because with YouTube, the way it works is you know you you have a video. They have their guidelines, and with their guidelines is if the video falls out of that guideline, they'll demonetize the video. However, which you can still put the video up. However, the problem is, is the video is not going to get the distribution that it normally would on a monetized video, because mm -hmm. why would they push a video that they're not, they're not making money on? Right. And so by and large, yeah, of course, I want the, I want the monetization from the video, the, mon the amount of work that goes into it, the money you have to pay to get the video done, so forth and so on. And it's the time spent. That being said, too, I still want the video to get distribution, because if it doesn't get distribution, then it doesn't have the effect that it needs to have with respect to the advocacy. Yeah, because you, you seem like to be one of the only guys that survived it. We had some friends of ours. Remember with uh, Richard Ryan and those guys? Um, yeah, I mean, he owns Full Mag. That, that thing's been crippled. Uh, mm -hmm. I would say uh, uh, some of the other guys have done all right. Um, uh, I think Bunk Bunker and their whole crew have done okay still on YouTube. Did Rated Red ever pop back up, or were they? Well, no, Rated Red left because or they they disappeared because uh, uh, Verizon Hearst mismanaged that deal so bad. I, mean, I got gotcha. you. They they fucked that up big time. But yeah, it wasn't I don't think it was about guns necessarily because they were they were less gun content and more like hunting fishing stuff. Yeah, you know what I mean, like just hillbilly bullshit. Anyways, uh, yeah, you've well, it's, I'm look look at me, come on. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> Colin's laughing over there, and I I, he that. just got back, you know, from the sitting in Pelosi's office on January sixth. So yeah. now we're fine over here. We know who we are as white people. You know what I'm saying? What we look like. It's we're good. We're good on that, Colin. Yeah. For example, if I was to request an interview with Lori Lightfoot, I wouldn't get it <laughs> because apparently she only gives interviews now to black and brown people. Yes. Or you, yes. or you could just become a gay white woman. I could. Yeah. I mean, that's look. It's working out for fucking Caitlyn <laughs> Jenner. Yeah, running for governor yeah. of California. So it used to be to run for office, you had to like put together a bunch of plans for what you were going to do while in office. Now you just got to get your dick cut off. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wait, did he? Did, did he actually do that? Yes, I have no idea. Yeah, yeah, he got a lot tough. I heard he got a lot tough. I don't know. I, 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 I don't when know. he, I know Elliot Page did. Like, if you're going to do it, do it. Put Elliot. I, I Page, tell my kids this: go, Elliot go Page for everything in this life. Go for it all. Uh, don't be a pussy about it. If you're going to do it, do it. And that's uh, what I tell my but, children. But Elliot Page didn't have a dick. No, she's going to put on, which is sweet. Like, dude, if you get to oh, choose I, your I'm dick. Stu I'm stupid. I thought, I thought we were talking about what's, what's, uh, what's her face? Caitlyn uh, Jenner? The card, uh, yeah, Jenner. Yeah. Jenner, yeah. Yeah, that's the same person. Okay, yeah. okay. okay gotcha. Yeah, running for governor right now. And then, you know, speaking of which, because uh, we were talking about the, uh, the Beto thing earlier, right mm -hmm. as this gun thing passed today, uh, he's now mulling an option to run for governor against Abbott here in Texas. Uh, the and I, I honestly think, I, I really honestly think people, people should not take that as a joke. I, he could seriously win. I, I, I did too. And like th when I read this article this morning, um, I, I was like, oh shit. Uh, the people who were voting for governor is a different base that votes for president of the United States. And this is every two years. So you're going to be in an off election cycle here in 2022. And which is one it. where typically conservatives don't come out to vote unless there's a compelling reason. To Correct. During, and, during mid midterm elections. And I think with this gun issue that that popped up today, this bill that passed, he's got all the ammo, pun intended, that he needs to run for his base. And uh, and there, he could be a serious contender in this thing against Abbott, especially if, uh, you know, hopefully this isn't the case, but McConaughey talking about running for governor. And he's he's a center right guy for the most part. That would almost guarantee that Beto would get elected if he if he ran that way because he 
in in the process leading up to him like if he would run as an independent you would imagine right it would be like Boy. Ross. It would be like Ross Perot in ninety two and ninety six. The only reason Bill Clinton was ever president is because of Ross fucking Perot. Yeah, yeah. that's it. The yeah. only reason that that fucking rapist was ever president is because of Ross Perot. Thanks a lot, Ross. R. I. P. R. I. P. Is he dead? I uh, probably. Not. Uh, he was a thousand years old back then. Who the fuck knows? I think he's still alive, probably. Um, yeah, but but back to Beto. Like, dude, you're a Texas guy. We're Texas people. Uh, shit. Like we were talking about earlier, Austin's blue, San Antonio's blue. Uh, fucking Houston and Dallas are blue. If they all come out and vote, that's they, pretty much game they over. They will because he's going to have a shit ton of money behind him. Oh, yeah. Most, also, mostly from outside also, the state. Go ahead. Mostly from outside the state. Yes. But then he's also, they also have a much better command of social media and marketing mm. than the conservatives do. Sure do. Yeah, and that's, that's again. That's large how most of the people, like, <clears throat> Most of the people voting for Beto don't even know what Beto stands for. Right. But, they're, but they're like, he's, he's so cool and relatable, you know? So from that perspective, you're getting a lot of these kids who Is he? aren't 20, 20 years. They, they have no political history. Right. So for them, they're just like, he seems cool. I don't, they're not really going to relate to an old white guy in a wheelchair, you know, not trying to speak ill on Abbott. I like Abbott. But well, if he started dressing the, like Professor X, maybe. Uh, like, yeah, if, he, if he straight maybe, up came out every day in costume wow. dressed like Patrick Stewart, I think he yeah. could win. Yeah. But the thing is, is, like, these, these, these kids are, are voting on optics, period. Mm. That's it. And then, on, not, and then on top of that, even the people who are older but tend to lean more left, all they're going to vote on is someone who's expressing their, their, their kind of surface-level ideologies. Right. From a, you know, from a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, identity politics standpoint, mm. right? And so he knows all the buzzwords. He knows how to say all of those things to get them feel all warm and fuzzy on the inside. And from that perspective, even though he's wholly incompetent, but they won't know that because of the mask that will be worn during the election season. Right, so it's even more important what uh, Texans like us are doing. Look, I don't give... I. I don't know if you can see it right here, but my, this says all politicians are cunts. That's something I really believe in. I think the politicians are some of the worst people on the planet. Uh, I think that people who uh, deserve power very rarely want it. People that want it very rarely deserve it. I think that's pretty much a maxim that, that crosses all boundaries throughout history. But there is a difference between somebody who's trying to give you more rights and somebody who's trying to give you less, right? I mean, you have, as a conscious human being in today's climate, you have to understand that as much as you might hate politicians. <clears throat> if somebody's constantly trying to give shit back to you in the form of liberty, that's fine. And I say this all the time, by the way. I know you two guys are probably conservative, but conservatives are just trying to steal your money. Liberals are trying to steal your liberty. That's the fucking problem. I can defend my money. I'm fine with that. I'm smarter than they are. But I can't defend myself if the entire system is built to take my liberty away. Right. I think I think I think what a lot of people forget is that, you know everybody wants to bring the nobility into the idea of politics. I'm I'm and this is going to sound like a massive contradiction. I am a Machiavellian with a conscience. Um, I, I understand the game of politics, which is largely why a lot of times I don't want to get involved in it. But like you pointed out succinctly, you know you are more or less picking the lesser of two evils. Mm -hmm. Which evil can I can I can I actually do something about versus one that literally cripples me? Right. And so. That's a point that I try to get people to understand the entire time. Like you don't get freedom back. Nobody, nobody who's nobody who's seeking power from you or control over you gives the control right. up. When, when in the history of control, or power, or or any and or influence or anything, has somebody been giving it, given it, and then willingly given it up without it having to be taken by force? Never. I'll wait. Yeah, never. Please let me know when that happens, and I'll be there to witness it. Maybe. Colin, has anybody ever asked you to run? <laughs> in all sincerity. Every. every freaking day I, I figured and the reason i brought this up is i assume uh, your response is the same as mine go fuck yourself yeah <laughs> I, it, it depends it depends i look dude a, a buddy of, my, of ours hit us up uh this morning graham allen um he's running in south carolina against uh who's the guy who voted for uh was one of the the, the congressmen who who voted for impeachment against trump after the fact uh, it was one of the 10. I have no idea. Uh, yeah, it, was, it was one of the 10 congressmen who, uh, who voted for impeachment against Trump. And uh, it was the same thing before he decided to do it. People were hitting him up every single day as well. 
does it get to be enough where you're just like, all right, fuck it, I'll do it because I want things to change? Or where do you live in that? Uh, so I'm a bit of a hedonistic Bible thumper. So whenever he, if he calls upon me to do it, sure. Um, and I know it sounds like a cop out, but I really honestly personally have no desire. Um, when, I, you're, I, when you're talking I about he, are you talking I, about I, God? Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. I was... <laughs> yeah. Um, so if that's if that's something that I'm called upon to do, and you know, I'll fight it tooth and nail until it's just undeniable. But right now, personally, I have no desire. I, I think there's too much. I've I've done I've done my dance with big organizations. Like when I was with the NRA, I met a ton of great people there. Um, I think right. I think a lot of them are kind of being unfairly labeled. Um, as being not very pro 2A because I've dealt with these people and I know how adamant they are about protecting it. Unfortunately, they are but small fish in a big pond with big fish um, who actually make decisions that they have no control of. So I've, I've, I've attached myself to a, an entity like that before and I, I've had my frustrations. And so I can only imagine what would happen, the, the, the amount of maneuvering that I would have to do if I were to become a politician. And then the things that I don't know that I don't know mm. um, with respect to that. And I, none of that seems very <sighs> desirable to me, honestly. Um, but if I do think, and I mean genuinely, genuinely, and to be honest with you, for me to do it, I'd have to be freaking i'd have to have close to fuck you money mm, yeah <clears throat> because i need to be in a position to, i always want to be in a position where i can walk away and say no because and that ha and, and not be leveraged by the enticement of making money or the or the enticement of losing money to continue to live my life right um so before we even get to that conversation i'd have to get to fuck you money status yeah and, and look if you look at mcconaughey he definitely has it um, I, can I can promise you that. He's got the fuck you money if he wanted to do it. Uh, but then it's like, dude, why would you leave all that money in Hollywood uh, and just be the fucking coolest guy on the planet right. to come be fucking governor well, I think of a state against where half the people will automatically hate you and you're already beloved here in this state already? I, I really believe that <clears throat> a better option for him would be to run for mayor of Austin. That makes a lot more sense than governor for him. It also makes more sense for the state of Texas for him to do that because, let's be real, mayor, fuck do you really do? Obviously nothing. If Adler's <laughs> any fucking, uh, if Adler's uh, any representation of what you do as a mayor, you don't do shit. Because I live downtown, and <clears throat> two weeks now after passing a bill where they're supposed to help clean up this homeless issue, they're not. Not only are they still there, they've moved all their shit onto City Hall's property. Really? Yeah, it's all on fucking right on City Hall's property. Right there. <laughs> That's how much of a can fucking. I, can I jump off real quick? Guess. Come right back. And yeah, 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 absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah, you, you take a piss. It's, it's drinking bros, baby. It's drinking bros. Um, I did not see that. I have not driven downtown in a while. Is that was that on purpose? Was that intentional? That they moved their shit there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. So they wanted to make a statement being homeless by moving to their. Yeah, and there's all kinds of cute signs up there too. Like, oh, fucking. Is, why, is that real? Why? <laughs> Why do we have to do stuff? Actually, when I drove by uh, <clears throat> last night on my way home from picking up my dogs, <clears throat> there was a guy with a fucking barbecue. Like, not, not one of those small Weber things. It was like a full-on barbecue. Yeah. And he was just cooking, sitting there, flipping through his iPhone <laughs> in a tent, like right on City Hall property. You may as well just walk up on the steps and take a shit. Uh, you know it'd, be, I mean? if, it'd be great if it was a Traeger that required pellets, because those pellets are. Let's face it; those are He's eighteen bucks. Of pellets, yeah. Those are eighteen bucks a pack on those fucking things. So if he was using a full-on Traeger and then pellets with it, and was just smoking meats out in front of City Hall, that would be the greatest flex of all time. It'd be pretty funny, yeah. Yeah, and the iPhone thing I don't get. There was a homeless dude around this area, uh, and he was <clears throat> on an iPhone as well. I was like. Where the fuck did you get that phone? It was, he's got a newer model than I do. Well, I've said, I've told this story a couple of times now, but we were walking, me and uh, Giorgio and a couple other people, Adam, well, no, Adam was already there, with Chuck Liddell. We were walking from a comedy, from the uh, from uh, Lonesome Dove restaurant oh, yeah, 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 to yeah, yeah. Vulcan Comedy Club here yeah. in Austin, <clears throat> which, by the way, is the new home for Kill Tony. 
uh, they just signed that deal yesterday. So oh, great. we were walking from there to there, and Chuck Liddell is an A-list celebrity. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I, I never knew what that meant until I went into public with him a bunch of times. And he just gets swarmed no matter where he goes. People, everybody loves this guy. Yeah, like, yeah. Even, I mean, I, I don't know if anybody doesn't like him. But the, the weird thing was fucking homeless dudes were coming up asking for pictures with him. Like, all right, cool, man. Where are you, where are you posting this? Yeah. Like, and he pulls out a fucking iPhone 12 and starts taking a selfie. I'm like, oh, shit. Maybe he's got a dope-ass homeless Instagram. Maybe he's a new homeless. Maybe. That's, that's a new thing. New no, actually, I was, uh, I'll say about three, four weeks ago. Mm. I was running around Austin with Vince Young, and I'd, I'd, I'd never met him before. Mm. Um, he's the same kind of guy there. Dude, like, the level of fanfare this guy received even to this day is insane. Yeah, it's wild. It is freaking insane. I was like, whoa. <laughs> I was like, Especially I was here. Like, I was a bit of a... Yeah, national champion, greatest game of all time, in my opinion, uh, fourth and three. I'll never forget it. It was at the Rose Bowl. It was amazing. Speaking of which, McConaughey was there. He was at that game. Um, <laughs> well, they were all raging. Uh, with, with you, uh, since we're, we're just talking about famous celebrity and all that shit, we, we just got a call to, to cover this Logan Paul, Floyd Mayweather fight. Um, it seems uh, like a lot of these guys are coming off of YouTube into boxing and everything else. You have 2 million subscribers on your YouTube account. Would you do that? Would you ever fucking fight somebody like from the far left? Because that would be, holy shit, that'd be some gangbuster ratings, dude. Yeah, I'd love to see that. I, so I used, to, I used to roll, right? I started, I started doing some rolling in MMA and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and whatnot. I had to stop because I kept getting hurt. And... I can't be up doing advocacy videos with a fucking black eye. <laughs> so, so more than likely, no. Um, yeah, no, I don't see myself doing it. Yeah. It's just not, not really my steal, though. Because I was on the yeah. phone last night. I was talking to Chuck's wife, actually. She was like, yeah, you know, we're going to go from here and then to the uh, Lamar Odom versus yeah. Aaron Carter fight. And I, when, oh. I got, when I hung up the phone, I was like, man, if you line up those two fights back to back, you're looking at Logan Paul against Floyd Mayweather at one, you know, the all time greatest record in the history of boxing, uh, tied with Rocky Marciano. Uh, and then the weekend after, he's actually refereeing the Lamar Odom Aaron Carter fights, which I never thought that I would hear in a million years. And we're booking travel to this. The, the, <laughs> so here's what I can tell you um, having, you know, been in production for 20 years at this point and haven't produced a lot of shit. You can always tell when an activity is super hot by the hotel prices. The hotel prices in Miami right now are through the roof, which means there's a fuck ton of people going to see Logan Paul fight Floyd Mayweather. I, I mean, it was, it's insane. Dude, I'm telling you, I was, I, I mean, I had plans. It's funny you say that. I had plans to come down to Austin this weekend. Mm. Um, I was looking at the hotel prices. I was like, for the proper? For the line? Nope, nope, not doing it. <laughs> I do like the line hotel, but I'm not paying 600 bucks to stay there. Fuck that. No. You know what's funny about the line? Like the line, that's my favorite hotel, actually. Yeah, awesome. It is. Um, however, it's funny because everyone that clearly is like super far left. And then get in there, and I don't know if you've ever been in there, you notice like behind the registration desk, they literally have bullets. Yeah. Races. I was yeah. like, Oh, this is interesting. Because then I was like, you know, eh, it's Austin, so I guess yeah. it's not too far, too far off. But you know. <clears throat> well, I mean, look, even Dallas is actually different. Dallas is super fucking weird and lefty. Austin's weird and left, but it's still, it's still like Central Texas. When yeah. they tried to set up, yeah, yeah. when Antifa tried to set up that fucking uh, autonomous zone here, state police <laughs> got on horseback and literally rode them out of town. I, that's like old west shit. I've never heard of anything like that in modern society happening, but it happened here. Yeah, and you still have that, <laughs> that bit of Austin, you know, where it's like, man, it's still the old Texas, and it's fun to put up the empty shells as like a design, but none of those people would know how to use guns inside the hotel, and... Uh, and they're the nicest people in the world, but I'm yeah. like, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it, I just kind of just, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like you want to defund the police, and then you're gonna have some bullets up in the background there. <laughs> you don't need them, you don't need them. But the thing is, I actually, I actually really, really like Austin mm -hmm. in a very odd way. Like I really do. Like I, 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 a lot of times I'll just come out there just to kind of decompress 
I'll throw, throw, throw a duffel bag in the back of the car, drive out there, come decompress for a day or two, and then drive back to Dallas. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, but, you know, Austin is Austin. It is, yeah, and, and same. Like, even though we, we just moved here, I'd been here, like, 50 times before. Uh, it was one, there was one point where Dan and I were coming once every single month mm. for, like, 10 wow. months, and finally we were just like, fuck it, let's just, let's just move there <laughs> um, for guests and everything. And uh, uh, But I'd shot a couple films here and lived here for maybe – five or six months total between those, those films. I love this city. Um, I yeah. think it's beautiful. I, I don't want any of the homelessness. I don't want any of this shit here in Austin. It is one of the last cities that you can walk around. There's a beautiful river. The downtown scene is fun. The bars are fun. It's diverse and everybody gets along. Like I don't see any problems when people are out at bars or on Sixth Street at nights. Um, between whites, blacks, a anyone, mm -hmm. everybody gets along in this city, and it's so rare. Because look, look, I'm from Atlanta uh, originally, and like, dude, <laughs> they straight up told us they're like, dude, if you're white, you should probably hop on out of here uh, right around 9:45, <laughs> 10 p.m. Uh, but you don't have that in Austin, and I yeah. want it to stay that way. Uh, because I do love this city. Um, so, look, we'll see what happens with the homelessness and all the other shit. But the unfortunate part about it is it, it really does depend on politicians. Yeah. Uh, and we're stuck. We're stuck I in the same cycle. Look, nothing I got to point out. I was, was going to buy a second place in Austin. Fuck that. Yeah, well, These right now. Not. Californians, <laughs> they are driving the price the, the the real estate property in in Austin is just insane. Yeah, it's, it's wild. Bad shit. Yeah, I mean it's and but this is a. <clears throat> I think it has less to do with the politics of California's moving here. It's just the demand on property and then tech companies moving here. Yep. I went through this in the Bay. I lived in Oakland for like eight years. When I first moved there, my rent for a two bedroom like thirteen hundred square foot place was about eighteen hundred bucks a month. By the time I left, it was like 24. And when I moved out, they relisted it for 38. And it's because Chinese investors were coming into the cities and <clears throat> offering 20 to 40% above market value cash. Now, he had a neighbor about six months ago. Some dude just walked up to his fucking house and offered him, uh, I think he bought the house for 600,000 and he offered him 1.4 mil for it. Yep. Just to get, here's, here's money, get the fuck out. Like they're, they're buying up shit everywhere so families from california uh, have been going door to door so much so that they you know they had to come out and, and discourage it uh, so now they're they're having their realtors call you so what they'll do is they'll go through the background of your property and it's all realtors local realtors who are calling for california clients to try to buy your house oh i get i get those text messages probably once a week i get text random just random text messages Hey, you live at such and such. Um, you willing to sell your house? I was like, yeah, give me five million. You're good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a couple years, you might not be that far off. Cause I mean, <laughs> those same neighbors that turned it down that, that Dan was talking about, um, the other neighbor, they, they said no, but, but our other neighbors took it. It was this, yeah. this gay couple. And I just moved in like two weeks before into this neighborhood. Wow. And so there's a, a brewery at the front of the neighborhood and I was up there at the brewery and they were like, hey, we're having a going away party for such and such in the neighborhood. And I was like, oh, I, I didn't get to meet them. And they were like, you know what? They took that money. Remember the, those couples that were going door to door? They took the money. It was this gay couple. You've never seen partying like that they were because they were not expecting that price for that house. And they were like, fuck it. We're out of here. And I was like, where are you guys going? They were like, we can buy a house on the beach in Florida in cash and not have to worry about shit after the sale of this. And I was like, eh. All right, I don't blame you. I don't blame you. There will be a number, Colin, and you're going to do it one day. Uh, the, the funny thing is that you telling that story about the gay couple reminded me about the place where I live now. Um, I remember before I moved here, I was renting in, in downtown. I was staying at a loft in downtown Dallas on Main Street. And so I was like, okay, it's time for me to move, you know, buy something. And so this is before prices started going nuts. And so I'm driving around, I'm like, I'm like, yeah, this is a really dope neighborhood. I think I might, you know, entertain moving here. So I see some guys outside there, like, like this house is having a party or whatever. So I drive up and I'm like, you know, let me just hop out and just kind of ask them, you know, what, what are things like in the neighborhood, so forth and so on. I get out and I'm walking up and I'm walking up and I, I'm talking to one of the guys. I'm like, hey, you know, I'm kind of looking around to see where I want to move. And, um, you know, just I see you guys having a party. I just wanted to see, you know, what you guys thought about the area. And um, he was just like, oh, it's awesome, you know, and then he was just kind of going. And it, it, it took me a second, but I realized it was a gay party. Um, and so I was like, oh, 
okay, okay, that's interesting. Like, well, what, whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. It just got really odd once I was like, all right, you know, thanks for the information. They were really cool. But then uh, afterwards, it was like, you know, you know, you want to come in and hang out? I was like, oh, no, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. He's like, are you sure? <clears throat> like, yeah. He was like, yeah, we should exchange numbers sometimes. Maybe I was like, no, I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but no, no, you know, everything's great. I, I actually ended up moving into the neighborhood, ironically enough, about two and a half years later. Yep. Um, and then I was an idiot. Like I could have, I could have made bank. Oh yeah. Uh, oh yeah. As soon as I came back, prices, yeah, uh, it hurt. That one hurt. I was sad because gays throw the best parties. So when they were <laughs> when they left the neighborhood after two weeks, I was like, shit. I knew one night, you know, they would have everyone over. We'd have some ecstasy and share some laughs, right? Um, so when they moved out, I was like, fuck, man, I think we're down to like one gay couple in the neighborhood. It's kind of sucks. Uh, Cause everybody knows like in LA, people make fun of West Hollywood, but dude, those guys fucking rage, dude, every night. And they're the nicest people on the planet. They where also like, increase property value quite a bit. Yes, it's yeah, so, do. dude, yeah. it's the smartest buy you could have made. You should have hopped on the phone with me, Colin. I would have said, dude, buy that up immediately. Well, I didn't, I did not buy it because of them at the time. I was just, I, I just had buying anxiety. I was just kind of mm. like, uh, I'm not really sure. You know, I'm kind of a commitment phobe. So I was like, uh, you know, I was used to just hopping in and out of condos whenever I felt like it. So I was just like, uh, and then finally I just pulled the trigger and, and decided to do it. I mean, don't get me wrong. We still like, I want to say maybe 10, I'd say we, we have a good number of, of gay couples in this neighborhood still very much so. so. You need them. I've been recruiting. Yeah. You have to. Like, I've been going to the, the local gay clubs, not because I enjoy them. Uh, Obviously. Just just to recruit. That's yes, all. It's that's the only it. reason I'm there. That's it. If, if anybody in the media asks, it's the only reason. Yeah, it's the only reason Dan's there. Uh, but it's happening everywhere. A, a buddy of mine is uh, trying to open up a brewery in Frisco right now. Um, and even, fr dude, Frisco's prices are through the roof. Our, our partner in our ticket company, he just sold his house in Frisco. The money got too big, and he was yeah. like, I'm good, fam. I'm out of here. Crazy. Yeah. Like and so, did, who, who do you know where who was trying to buy it? Was it like someone from China or something, or was it just? Uh, they were representing a couple from out of state because that's the new thing that they're saying now. Because Texans in particular are starting to get worried of like, ah, shit, can we not sell to California? You know, the the don't California my Texas thing has now become a T-shirt here, um, and then people are talking about it in neighborhoods for real, where they're just like. Hey guys, if we keep selling to Californians, I think we're gonna lose all of the seats on the school board and all these other things. And and it's true, but again, the money gets to a certain level where you're like, uh, I could retire off of this. It won't last though. You no. don't think so? Fuck no. I, I remember I, I did an interview with C, I think it was CBS or in, in, uh, NBC or something like that. And it was about the migration of people from California to Texas. And um, the girl who was doing the, the actual uh, report, she came across my video that I did about, you know, people coming from California and voting for gun laws that are ant not advantageous to the Second Amendment. And the more I think about it, and I don't think it's going to last. The reason why I don't think it's going to last is give it three summers. It's too hot. Yeah. I, I, I've been in California. I just got back from San Diego. <laughs> yeah. The weather is freaking amazing. Yeah. There's no way in hell you go from living there for as long as you have and then moving to the, the hell hole that is the Texas weather and be happy. <laughs> I promise you, it won't last. They, I don't think they have the mental fortitude. I don't. You're right, man. It was, I was, cause I was shell shocked. It's psychotic to live in Texas to deal with this weather, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I was shell shocked when we moved here cause I was in LA for 18 years and then wow. we got here and I, I didn't understand like every house had a pool here and I was like, I don't really get that. <laughs> like, is that necessary? Cause I grew up in Georgia and I was like, that's, it was hot in Georgia. Different, yeah. different yeah. kind of hot yeah. here. Mm -hmm. It was, this is, this is devil heat. Oh yeah, De devil heat, and it was uh, over 106 degrees for 27 straight days at one point. And I looked at my wife and I said, "Well, you know, the money we saved by by buying that house without the, we're gonna have to put a fucking pool in here." Oh, because yeah. it's no, like seriously, man. It's I I've lived here my entire life. I'm still not used to it. I. Still get angry when I step outside of the house during the summer every single day, every single time, because it is so damn hot. I have to literally, do you know how embarrassing it is to take a shower just to go meet up with the chick to have drinks and your 
sweating your ass off because it's 90 degrees at nine o'clock in the evening. <laughs> and you just got done taking a shower. So your pores are wide open. And they're like, what's wrong? Are you nervous? Are you nervous? No, I'm not fucking nervous. I just, it's Texas. It's Texas and I took a shower. <laughs> are you dating right now? Or are you married? No, I'm definitely not married. <laughs> no, huh? Not married, no kids. Nope, none of that. Is that, in the, is that in the cards for you later on down the road? Oh, uh, if I decide to lose my mind. Because <laughs> <laughs> you and Dan have the same stance. I, Dan, I don't think you're getting married, are you? We'll see. I mean, I don't really give a shit about marriage. What's the point? Yeah. Kind of apathetic about it, too. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly happy being in a long-term monogamous relationship. But I just don't understand how the government getting involved in that makes my life any better. I think it's easier for the women because at least there's like a safety net of like, all right, if this guy fucks up and leaves, like I'm getting half of all of his shit. Yeah, I think I think marriage, I think it makes sense for a woman to want to be married. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For a dude, it's, it's, a, it's a little different. Um, let me ask you this. Have you gone out on dates with women and they didn't know what you did and then they got back to your house and they were like, oh, fuck, that's a lot of guns. <laughs> so... Uh, Yes, I think the one that stands out as I went on a date and um, she met she, she met at my place and then we Ubered to the bar. And so usually anytime I, I've done that, um, I usually sweep my entire house for guns. I sweep it. I'll maybe leave one out, but I'll sweep it because I usually don't tell when I meet what I do. So they either know or they don't know at all. So I'll usually sweep the house of guns and just maybe leave one gun out or something like that. Um, and I remember she came in there and... Um, we, then we got into Uber, we went, had drinks, we're sitting at the bar, and then halfway through the conversation, she's like, you know, I think it's kind of cool that you're into guns. And I was like, what? And she was like, I saw the, I saw the gun on the, on, the, on the coffee table deal, whatever. And she's like, you know, I think that's pretty, pretty cool that you're into guns. And I was like, man, I was like, are you fucking trolling me? <laughs> like, 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 wait, what? Yeah. And she's like, she's like, yeah. She's like, she's like, yeah, I'm carrying a Glock 19 right now. Mm. And she's talking to me literally like in the most genuine way. She has no idea what I do. Well, you, uh, if you were ever going to get married, it would have been then. I think yeah, I think you passed up all, your opportunity. It's right all kind there. of downhill from there. <laughs> yep. All downhill from yeah, there. No, I, she, and to this day, she swears she had no idea who I, who I was, what I did. I still call bullshit, but she swears, she swears on it. That's hilarious. Have you ever brought in somebody back to the house and they were like, oh, fuck, I, I definitely didn't know what you did. And this is you've got all you're ready for Texas to secede. <laughs> yeah, it's especially when they don't. It's happened a couple of times, especially when they have no idea what I do, because I'm very cryptic. Um, I had this thing about me when I when I when I converse with women on uh, what I'm dealing with on that level. I'm very cryptic. It's just natural. It's just like no reason for it. I just am. So at the time they have no idea what I do. And so and I have this way I just I don't answer questions <laughs> so um when you come to a guy's house who you have no idea what he does and then you just see all the guns everywhere and you have no context for it just kind of either sort kind of sort of think he's a drug dealer an right. assassin right. or an arms dealer because <laughs> <So. laughs> one of those things you could go to dinner and say hey what do you do I'm a lawyer I'm a lawyer yes. and uh eh, I make a couple videos on the side just for laughs, <laughs> Just for laughs, and you could you could also you could also get away with that story. Um, I, mean, I do do that though. I, I like usually if you force if you force my hand, I'm just like yeah, I'm a lawyer, because I, I don't want to deal with the subsequent questions that come as a result of me saying yeah, I'm a two A advocate. Yeah, I don't feel like having that conversation if, uh, because then it, it dominates the conversation, and I don't I don't feel like dealing with that right now. I do this I do this for a living. I don't want to do that now while I'm sipping on Jameson. Yeah, so let's let's flip it. Has a girl ever said to you? Hey, dude, I don't like your stance on 2A. Fuck off, and, and I'm out of here. You know, oddly enough, no. Really? I know. I, yeah, I, I mean, I've had girls who I know who are anti-gun. They still mess, They still dealt with me, um, even though they didn't like it. But I've never had one that says, yup, no, nope, my body, I'm out of here. I don't, I don't guess my luck. <laughs> yeah, or, or it's just not like the media says, Colin. You know, people really just don't give a shit because right yeah, now, exactly. the way they portray it, is like, oh yeah, if you're this, you're this, and if you're not, you're that. But if you're going on dates and girls are like, eh, I don't really give a shit. I will say that I have noticed in, in the rare times that I've, I've, you know, I've been around a girl who kind of really felt some strongly about it in the, from the anti-perspective, um, the intrigue always overrides the ideology. So they may not like it, but when confronted in, in the face of it, they're, they're intrigued. 
There's no, there's no denying it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because, I mean, I'm sure you can take him out shooting and show him shit where, you know, most people can't do that. And you're like, hey, look, I can show you how to, to, to shoot safely, properly, all that other stuff. And plus, with all the cool shit in the background you got of your place right now. <laughs> they never see this room. Oh, they never see that room. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Mm -mm. Like, unless, like, you, like, we've really established... Um, you know, where I'm really cool with you from, from that standpoint, generally speaking, when I was dating really, really heavy, I mean, I'm busy as hell now, yeah. but like when I was really kind of just living that life, no, they didn't see this room. <laughs> That's funny. We got a, we got a friend of ours who's like that too. He's got a massive room like that in his house and you have to be a bro to get in there. I don't, I don't think he's let any women in there before. <laughs> Cause he's got a fucking arsenal, but he's got like old school shit too, where it's like, he had like a musket, like a re like a musket, you know, where you're like, ah, oh, shit. What, what is that? Like, is that from the pilgrims? Like, where did you get a goddamn musket from? And he was just like, I don't even have a damn musket. Yeah. I, think I, my game up, man. I don't think there's any reason to probably so. Nah, no, dude. Well, it, man, you're undervaluing the cool factor. <laughs> yes. You shit. You, dude, you pull out a fucking musket in today's yeah, world. If you pull out a musket, I'm going to take it from you and beat you to death. You kidding me? It's because you're jealous that I have a musket. Probably, yeah. <laughs> but the result is the same, so it is. Saying. It just takes a lot longer to load. I'm just out there beating gun collectors to death for, out of jealousy. It's like uh, once upon a time in Mexico where Johnny Depp kills the chef to restore balance to the universe because the fucking food was too good. Yeah, <laughs> I understand that. Sometimes I eat food. I'm like motherfucker. What's the rarest thing you got there in your catalog? Rarest? Yeah. Ooh. Thing is, I don't have everything here because I have I have some in my studio as well. What would be the rarest? What would what would be your favorite? Like if there was a fire and you could only take one. This yeah. Is, that's the, that's now the, you're under pressure. That's the worst game of Would You Rather ever. By the yeah. way, that's that was my. I think, I think I'm a sociopath for even trying to attempt to, uh, to answer it. Yeah. Ah oh, man, I think this is gonna sound weird. I think it'd be between my HK MR556 SBR or my Daniel Defense Mark 18. Is that, that's the civilian version of the 416, right? That HK. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. yeah that's a good gun. Yeah. It's, I think that those, I don't know why my mind just, like when you ask the question, uh -huh. that's initially where my mind went. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, I, I think, I think I'm more looking at it from a utility standpoint. I think from a, for me, because I know with that, I mean, I can always go get my goddamn hands on a Glock to carry hmm. or, you know, whatever. But those those two, even though I think the HK MR556 is brutally heavy, um, I think there's something, there's just very something practical about the Mark 18 and just the versatility of things that I, I can do with that rifle from hmm. a self-defense standpoint if I needed to. You know, s small enough to, 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 to haul it around without too much issue or hassle. Um, long enough to do to do work if I needed to do work, you know, from a self defense standpoint. Um, so I think that, by and large, would be be what it is. Because at the end of the day, as much as I wax poetic about the sexiness and the intrinsic value of firearms, at the end of the day, I'm always going to fall back on the practical. There it is. That's the question that people wanted, and I, I think it's important to end on something like that. Now's the point in the show we get to the drinking bro of the week, Colin, which is someone who has inspired you or helped you become the person you are today. Who would you like to give the drinking bro of the week to? Damn. We come with the heavy hitters at the end. You know what I'm saying? I, I want to leave you with some oh, thoughts man. on your mind when you leave this interview. So you're talking about the person that inspired me to be who I am today? Yep. It can be a man or a woman or somebody who's pan or somebody that's both. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, I'm going to do two people. And, and the reason I'm saying this one, one of them is a woman and it's, it's pretty standard and typical, which would mm -hmm. be my mother. Um, and, and the reason why, and I've said this before in, in private, not really so much in public, my mom went out of her way. She raised me. She was single. She was single parent mother. She raised me by herself. Me and my dad had, a, had a, a relationship more so towards the end of his life. Mm. But, I, I just thank her vehemently for not raising a bitch um, or not raising me like a punk bitch. <laughs> um, it it could have easily gone south, man, let me tell you. Um, my mom was stern, man. <laughs> like, she overcompensated like a mother. <laughs> so 
Um, you know, it, it, every, it, when I think back, when I fall back onto my, my foundation um, from getting through hard times, my work ethic, all of those things, my drive, my mom always comes to mind because the things that she knew she couldn't do as a woman, she made sure she had men in place um, that she forced me to interact with to help make up for those deficits. So, you know, like when she always say, go see Dr. Johnson. She was a nurse. She worked at the hospital. She's like, go talk to Dr. Why the hell you want to talk? I don't care about Dr. Johnson. <laughs> go talk to Dr. Johnson. Um, you know, he's a very successful cardiologist. Um, so when it comes to the idea of who I model myself after as men, it's those people that she forced me to go be around um, in order to develop, develop myself as yeah. I am now. The second person would be Bruce Wayne. Bruce Wayne? I'm into that. Batman. Which one? Here we go. This is the real. There we go. Now we're starting to get into it. Meat and potatoes. Gun to head, dude. Who are you I taking like as, as Batman? Like Christian. Christian Bale? Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm with you on that. It's hard to argue with that. It, it is. It, it is. I, I mean, but for what it is, I like Affleck and the new DC ones because they're trying to intentionally go dark with it. Mm -hmm. And he's. I do. I do and the thing, that's why I hesitated because yeah. I did. Speaking of mother, leave me alone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I like Affleck too, but Christian, he just. In my head, I think I'm Bruce Wayne. So that's a, that's where that whole motivation comes from. Um, and I'm fucking terrified of bats. It's 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 on a clinical level. Like it, That's a weird mean, thing to be I know afraid of. Y'all have that little weird thing in Austin yeah, where you got yeah. the bats under the bridge and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> you should just change your name to Black Bruce Wayne. I may or may not have a fake account somewhere under that alias. It's it's BBC oh, Bruce that's, Wayne. That's great. Uh, <laughs> BBC Bruce Wayne. Yeah, because they're they're making a black Superman right now. They're casting it in Hollywood. Oh, are they? Uh -huh. Yeah. Oh, is that the one they were talking about doing uh, with uh, what's his face? Um, <clears throat> Michael B. Jordan, possibly. Being? Maybe. Well, I mean, it actually makes sense. It doesn't make sense with Superman. It makes sense with Batman because even in the comic series, there were other Batman. Right. There were other dudes that came along and played the Batman role or whatever the fuck. Same thing with mm -hmm. Captain America, by the way. Mm -hmm. Wasn't it? What's, what's his fight? It was uh, Fox's son, wasn't it? Yeah, Lucius Fox's yeah. son, yeah. 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 And then there was uh there've been multiple uh uh Captain Americas, right, of different races and shit like that. That's not a that's not a big deal. That and it, it's not a big deal either way. It's just weird that you would like I, why does Superman need to be white? Why not make another character that's black? You know what I mean? So so I I I I struggle with this, right? Mm -hmm. So because I like so the the um I'm naturally biased. So I'm like, oh, it'd be cool to see a black Superman. But then I'm like, right. why force it? Why not just create an original character that's mm -hmm. black? Because it's easier to yeah. ride on the coattails. Exactly. But that's not what it's supposed oh. to be. You know what I mean? Because yeah, like, even like now, even with James Bond, right? Like I was all for like, like he just saw this, this James Bond. That would be freaking awesome. That, actually, it's I'm cool. fine with that because 007 is a designation given to. But weren't they all white? They they have been all white so far, but there's there've been women versions or not. I'm no, sorry. Right. There's a yes. double, there's a double oh six that's a, a black woman, woman actually uh, is yeah. doing. She it. was double oh six or no, she was like double oh eight or nine. Yeah, or yeah, like yeah, 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 yeah. So okay. it's like okay. that makes sense to me too. But why again? Why why wedge it in there? That's not the point of any of this. The point is I to create it, an original superhero like fucking Blade. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah, yeah. a great goddamn example of an, an amazing superhero character that had a giant franchise of movies. Right, and it was an original character that was black. Why can't you do that again? Because it's it's not easy to write good shit. That's original. why. That's or why. Completely, or completely, like you said, completely flesh out. Um, black Panther. Yeah. yeah. You know, and like, look, look. I'll be honest and say, is the movie a little bit overhyped? Yes, I enjoyed it for biased reasons. Right. But I, but when I cut, when I roll back and think from a writing standpoint, how I thought they could have really fleshed out the characters. Mm. I think it could have been done better. Now you could kind of say that about almost anything, but I, I think it, there should be more. I want, I wanted more meat. <laughs> yeah, I thought um, the uh, I thought the actual movie Black Panther was a little bit problematic in its narrative, which is that <clears throat> the uh, country has all this tech that they're not sharing with the diaspora, the black diaspora, and because of that, this dude's dad who got killed comes back, and and the results. Even, like if you're looking at this from the, the woke standpoint, the result is this kid that was clearly wronged, right? Mm -hmm. Not only by his home country, but by society at large, gets angry, comes back to fight against it, and revenge, his revenge is met with fucking punishment. 
That seems a little weird. Uh, an odd narrative from a, a movie that was supposed to be intended to promote blackness. Yeah, I noticed right? that too. <laughs> that's 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 very odd to me that he's the villain, the guy that fucking got fucked over his entire goddamn life. Oh, wow. Yeah, is the villain in that movie? Do they not see that shit happening, or are they just fucking stupid? Maybe they're stupid. I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? The, the one that got it right was Roadhouse. It's a perfect movie. I was a bouncer. That's exactly how it was, and I was I was identical to Patrick Swayze. So. A lot of tight jeans, a lot of roundhouse yeah, kicks. Dude, that's exactly how it was. Um, since I, since we have you here and you are the gun expert, is there a movie? that you watched that you were like, God damn it, man. Gun-wise, it just threw you so far out of it that you were like, these people, that, that's not real. That wouldn't do that in this film. No, because I get 10 seconds into it and I stop watching. Yeah. Really? What, what was one of those where you just turned it off after 10 seconds? It. Like, that's how forgettable it is. Like, I mm. would literally, like, I'm, a, I'm either working, working out, or binge watching something. Mm. So for me, I, I'll find shows and I'm like, nope. Like, as soon as, and I'll know the, the first shot, usually they can kind of fake it before the shooting starts. Yeah. Once the shooting starts and movement happens, as soon as I start seeing some shit, you know what? Amer American um, American Assassin. Okay. That god awful. Yeah, it was god bad. awful. Oh and, my god. And it's a, it's a bad. disservice because the <laughs> the Mitch Rap character is one of the most badass fictional characters in the history of American uh, literature. Like he mm -hmm. is he is legit, and I there are people. So there, there's this, this whole Jason Bourne thing, that's bullshit. That doesn't exist. But Mitch Rapp's character, that shit exists in real life. Special Activities Division guys doing shit like that. And it's, I hated that they came out and, and fucked that up so badly. Because it, it was one of my favorite books. That's, one of my, that's probably my favorite fiction series that exists. And they, they butt fucked the shit out of it. I will say, to their credit, SEAL Team gets it right. But that's because half the staff is fucking Navy SEALs. <laughs> you know I love I mean? uh, like, that freaking series, you can't, man. Well, oh. we... There, yeah. So actually, Justin Melnick's coming into the studio today. Yeah, our buddy on the uh, show. Yeah, yeah, he's next. And, oh, man. I, I, that, so there are that's the two shows that I'm just like, when it, especially from the gunplay style side of things, too. Mm -hmm. It's SEAL Team so, um, and um, Strike Back. Yeah, Strike Back was great. Nobody fucking watched it, though, because it was on, what, Showtime or whatever? Showtime, yeah, yeah, it was phenomenal. Yeah. Freaking phenomenal. Now, they pushed it a little bit, right? Uh, just a little bit bad, but they kind of, you know, sometimes I'm like, really? But, well, yeah. But for the it, most yeah. part, for the most part. Now, from the last series, I can't remember her name, though. It's a little, little the little angry one, the um, um, little angry chick. Hang on. I can't remember her I'm name. That's from season oh, four, right? She, she was like, she was my favorite. Um, but yeah, she follows me, and I was happy about that. Oh, that's dope. Did you hit her back yeah. and say, yo, I'm a huge fan of the show? Yeah. I think that's why she followed me because mm. <laughs> I posted something about it first. I posted something about her being my favorite character. Uh, Is it uh, so, because she was one of she's one of the <clears throat> she's like a little tiny little woman, but like she's there beating up dudes in a way that was that didn't cause me to suspend my disbelief to the high hills, Press. right? Like like I it's like yeah, it's a stretch, but it it didn't feel Mary Sueish. Mm. Like, yeah. you know, like you got with like Captain Marvel and shit. Like, yeah. I, I was like, I can believe it. Is it gunplay was dead on. She, you could tell she put the time in. She, yeah, I loved her. Love her. Is it Michelle Luke's? I think so. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It, it that, better be. You follow her and she follows you. And if you fuck this up and she hears about it, you're going to get that unfollow and then you're going to question the rest of your life. I really am though. Like it's it's so funny how like the, the follows that you value the most. Like I genuinely value that follow because I feel like I developed a relationship with her over the series of watching it. So <laughs> so I am gonna feel some type of way. So you know I might right. have to find happiness at the bottom of a bottle if she doesn't follow me. Yeah, it happened to me and my wife with Terry Seymour. It was uh, she's a host on Extra, and we used to watch wow. Extra all the time. And then out of nowhere, she just started started following me and my wife. And we were like, oh, maybe she likes Ross Patterson Revolution. Maybe she likes the show. And then she unfollowed my wife, and then I never let her live it down. I was like, dude. And then she's like, does Terry Seymour love me? Probably. Am I re ready to risk it all? Probably. So take the things you want because I'm going to be going with Terry Seymour at this point. And then she unfollowed me too. I have not stopped thinking about it. And I don't know what we did um, as a couple or me as a person or was it her and then me. I'm not sure, but it's still stuck in my mind and I'm pissed off about it. <laughs> it hurts, man. It hurts. It hurts. What are you brother? What are you going to do? What are you either, way, do? either way, I think it's important to promote those shows that are getting it right. SEAL Team, obviously. I mean, you can't. They ha again, whenever they have extras working as other teams, 
they just bring seals up from Coronado to play the roles. Yeah, like it's they, awesome. don't, they don't even they don't even uh, cast yeah. people anymore, and that's why all those guys, DB and and fucking and uh, Neil and and AJ and Justin, all those guys, and they know. I mean, Tyler was Tyler, right? Yeah. But all the rest of the guys know, like, you can't get away with shit around here. Yeah. You fucking flag somebody or you pull some bullshit and somebody's going to see it. And they, Tyler's the most, he's the busiest guy on earth when yeah. they're filming. Yep. Because every time anything happens, they're like, hey, can you come watch this and see if this looks right? And he's like, God damn it, man. Can I just do my job, please? Are you paying <laughs> me for this? But either way, it's a, it's a great show. It's a great show. Yeah. You, have, you, you have great uh, programming on your YouTube channel. Tell everybody where they can find you. I am, man, I try to be all over the place, man. Uh, I am on YouTube under MrColeonNoir.com. I'm on Instagram at ColeonNoir.com. Uh, not ColeonNoir.com, but at ColeonNoir. Uh, I'm on Twitter at ColeonNoir. Um, where else am I? I'm on Gab now uh, under the same thing. Um, basically, I hate saying this because it sounds so pretentious, but it's the easiest way to do it. Just Google ColeonNoir. Yeah. All that will pop up. <laughs> All, all of that will pop up. Um, I'm terrible with pronouncing names, and I've never been good at that in my entire life. So uh, however many times I mispronounced that today, you're welcome for that. And yeah, if it makes you feel any better. on the show. If it makes you feel any better, about two minutes into our interview with Matthew McConaughey, McConaughey actually corrected him on how to say his name correctly. Yep. He still got it wrong the whole rest of the time. So. <laughs> the whole time, the whole time. When you've seen somebody's name so much in print, and like, like yours and McConaughey's, I, to, to my credit though i i said that to his face in, in public and he's never said anything to me he never corrected me right mm -hmm. um so to be fair when i see it in print for so long like your name his name uh my dad's name whatever man i have my own pronunciation in my head and that's not leaving that's not escaping me and uh and i'm i'm proud to own up to it proud to own up to it and i'm proud to have you on the show today uh you're awesome. entertaining fellow and uh and we're a big fan dude uh we've been trying to get you on for a while thank you for your time today we greatly appreciate it uh for d'anthony d'anthony holloway i'm ross patterson this is the drinking bros podcast good night everyone <laughs>